1998 also provided 1,053 schools with sanitation. So clearly, I think we want to say to the nation, it may not be good enough, but a lot has been done and continues to be done on a daily basis. And again, I don't want to use it as an excuse around the issues. I did say that I would clarify what happened with Lunga because, again, when your government does a death, you don't want to be part of the fray and debate that the school at which Lunga died, there were new proper, there was new proper sanitation. So she didn't die because we had not, as government, replaced old toilets. What happens is there were old toilets which unfortunately had not been demolished far away from the school, that way she drowned. Maybe the question is, why were those toilets not demolished? But the fact of the matter, there were new toilets at the school where Lumka tried. But also with, with Langlam, the fact of the matter is, we have provided new South African National Standard approved infrastructure, and we've been explaining this. It means that the school had new toilets. And again, I can't stand this government and say, yes, she didn't. But the fact of the matter, which I wanted to clarify today, is that she was not found in the pit latrine. She was found behind. Right? So Lang Lam was found in the tank of a senior toilet, not appropriate for her, because he was, he was, she was found in the adult section. And I don't want to be asking questions, because why would have not gone to senior toilet? And he was not finding the pit site. Because it was, with those toys, it's physically impossible for a human body to make its way from the pit side of the toilet to the back of the toilet. I don't know what it's called in English, but this was it's Damgok. That's where she was found, in the pit, a mover. And the lead, that's what. It is. So she was even too young to leave the manhole that covers the, the lid. So the manhole lid was removed. And, she, and then for with her body, she would not have lifted that, that manhole. And that's where the issue is. But what is important, which makes me also request that, request that the DG that we should have this press conference. The matter is under investigation. And I think there's a lot of questions outstanding and I don't want to go through them because they're a matter of investigation, but I just wanted to explain the matter without being defensive because all the same, it's a very sad death. The very sad death for a young kid at four to be found at the tank of the pit latrines at the back of the toilet. And I don't want to ask many questions around that to say why, is, why was he not in the bus, why did they the child from ECD go to the senior part. I think it's matters for police. So we want to ask these questions. We don't want to absolve government from responsibility because we all, we all owe it to ourselves, to Lang Lam and the nation for justice to ensure that all these questions are thoroughly interrogated and hopefully answered. And the media in this country is very good at investigative reporting and perhaps together, because it's a matter of investigating with law enforcement, our own queries can get to the bottom of how a child could die in a school that had infrastructure that met the norms and standards and could lose this way. And they, there's an officer, I know his name has been allocated to the case, so let's all wait for the investigation, but indeed continue to raise concerns about at least the close to 800 schools that we have not completed from the 3,000 schools. And I always tell members of the media chair that if we say we're doing 3,329, we've done 2,200, which means there's one extra school which doesn't have it. So they go to a school, they find a, 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 a school without proper sanitation, they say, but you said we're removing them. Yes, indeed. but. If I, I honestly say there's 800 outstanding, which means there's one also outstanding. But I thought, because <coughs> Mr. Van der says, and we'll just give you a sense and update the nation. We will give you all details. But what we also are dealing with, which we want to update the nation about, it's the 
disastrous situation about overcrowding because that's one other factor which we think is going to undermine our work as a department. Together with yourselves, we're all over experiencing provinces unable to place learners because there's not adequate spaces, experiencing classes which are overcrowded, and that we all know that it's one of the serious threats even to the work that we're doing. And again, we'll update the nations to what we're doing with uh, uh, overcrowding. And we're grateful to Treasury that it has again allocated funding to national departments because infrastructure is not a national competency. My work is to put norms and standards, monitor and support. But because of the desperate situation we find ourselves, we've agreed as government that national and also national agencies like your DPSAs, KUHA, should support provinces to confront the challenges that we face with infrastructure. The other matter which I really wanted to share, take advantage of this briefing, is about the rationalization of schools, because it's also another hot potato, especially in communities. We've been dealing with this matter for a very long time. Even when I was MEC, I was dealing with the rationalization of schools. Because as we monitor, we identify schools that should not be allowed to continue to operate as a result of declining enrollment numbers. The small schools face a number of challenges, including poor quality of teaching and learning, limited subject choices in secondary schools, high dropout rates, high progression, uh, uh, high failure, teachers not staying very long. And as a result, we have put together now a steering committee to say we have to, to decisively close schools which are unviable. Because if you look in these rural provinces, most of the schools that come with 0 to 10% pass rate are these small schools which are unviable schools. And it's not only a waste of time to really think we're running them, but it's also to waste children's lives to think we can achieve something when we know nothing can be done from those schools. The other matter I thought I should also use this press conference to, uh, to is about the Bella Bill. The Parliament is con it's, it, it, it's currently involved in public hearings. They have visited a number of provinces. They have been to the Free State. They have been to um, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and their four provinces, and Northwest. So they are remaining with the five provinces. And we really want people, our people to go and participate in this uh, public hearings. Policy. For us, it's a very important act. I was lucky that uh, I've been in the department for more. It's, it's almost eight years that we have been, we've been busy with this bill. And it's a very important bill for our work. We're looking at areas like access to education, because it's also a controversial issue where languages, race, and other things are used. We also are looking at the question of learner, compulsory learner attendance of language of learning or language in schools, of governance and professional management of public schools, budgets and finances of public schools, home education, independent schools, and educators. So simply it is to encourage uh, members or the public to, put, <coughs> to really ensure that they do attend these better hearings, they read the act, and make their voices or their opinions uh, uh, known. The other matter I, should, I thought uh, uh, I should take advantage of this briefing about is that it's, it's about general education certificate. Because we did announce, again, there was lots of, I think, I um, uh, 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 don't want to use a negative <laughs> word, uh, interest in the GEC. So I thought we should also report, because we had explained what the GEC is about, and I can see members of the media have, have, have the report. But I want to say we've started piloting the GEC. We've done it in 227 schools. This year we'll pilot it in 1,000 schools. And we hope that by 2025, there'll be a complete rollout of GEC. So that young people can, after grade nine, they can be able to have an official standard report card. Because what they currently have is the school reports which are not necessarily based on a national 
mod moderated exam. And that's what we want to say. So that a child in the Eastern Cape, when they say, I am a B student, it's, it's a national B. It has been moderated, it has been standardized, and that's what we're trying to do. And we've rolled out, and we hope that by 2025, we'll be able to implement it. You will also recall that at some stage we had what we call the ANA, and because of different challenges we had to stop ANA, and then we have a systemic evaluation. And I'm glad to report that the systemic evaluation study has been conducted, and it's a study which represents a comprehensive account of measuring learning outcomes in grade 3, 6, and 9, linked to a structured understanding of the teaching and learning context in South Africa, because unfortunately, we only have a standard assessment of our system only when we do international benchmarking or only when we do metric. Whereas it's very important for us as a nation to know at grade three what are the competencies, what are the weaknesses, so that everybody really has a standardized or a, a, a common understanding of what uh, our situation is. Everybody must know in South Africa how our grade sixes are, are, are performing, our grade nines, and not only wait for grade 12 to say these are the outcomes of our education system. So I also wanted to report that indeed we have started, we are reporting also on the work that we are doing around robotics, uh, because again we had made commitment that we will uh, uh, introduce robotics, and I really want to congratulate the coding and robotic challenge that took place last night at the University of Mpumalanga. Uh, so Ozias Tavana Secondary School in Vembe West won a STEM lab worth 1.1 million in Bredastrop High School. In the Overbeck District and Western Cape, they got the second position and won a cyber lab worth 600,000. And the third position was taken by Ndubaligai Ndu Ndu Secondary School in Kanyagute, and they also won a cyber lab of 300,000. But again, we'll give more information, more details on some of the programs that we're running as a sector during our budget vote, which is going to come soon. But mainly what we wanted to report and update the nation about is around school infrastructure, what progress we've made, because I think the concerns after Vicky's, Langalam Vicky's death are understandable, and I think it's calling upon us as government to account and explain what happened and what we're doing to make sure that these concerns that people legitimately raised are understood, if they are understood, but at least they are, we can account for them. So that's the purpose. So I'm going to ask you, DG, to really update yourselves and the nation around the work that we're doing around infrastructure, and in particular, work that we're doing in the eradication of your pit latrines. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, the presentation which the DJ will be delivering is currently available on the DBE YouTube channel. You can pick it up from there if you can't see it on the screen, but from home you can see it on the YouTube channel as it runs from this PC. DJ. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mklanga, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, colleagues from the Department of Basic Education, uh, colleagues from the media, uh, the South African public. Minister, is indeed uh, true that the death of one learner is one too many. A sense of agency prevails across the entire sector that we, we should move with a greater speed to replace uh, inappropriate and unsafe sanitation. Inappropriate and unsafe sanitation. Minister, it's for that reason that we've got various teams that uh, go out to provinces Every week I'm leading one of those teams and we do share this information on the social media as we do our work on a daily basis and we are willing, Minister, to even come back, whether it be next week, this time, uh, to feed back to the nation on the monitoring work uh, that we do. 
Um, I think, Minister, it's also important to just underscore the point that uh, in replacing inappropriate and unsafe uh, structures, particularly with pit latrines, it should not be understood as replacing pit latrines with reticulated toilets or facilities. There are parts of our country, as it, it is indeed true with the world, where running water is a problem and boreholes do not offer sustainable provision of water. We are now battling with a situation where we now have to move schools which depended on boreholes for the provision of reticulated water to uh, toilets and now convert them to dry solution. And dry solution, it's safe, appropriate sanitation that is used uh, by both uh, learners and staff. Minister, I'm going to be quick. Uh, I have uh, the weakness of speaking very slow. I'm going to compensate that by hitting the punchline and not going bullet by bullet. I'll just uh, highlight specific issues. This is the outline of the presentation. Mr. van der Westhuizen is going to come immediately after this presentation because, Minister, we also felt that it's uh, indeed uh, about time that the nation is briefed about the Kumape matter uh, with respect to the structural court interdict. We report to the presidency on this matter regularly to the DG in the presidency, so we are going to share that information as well. I must also indicate, Minister, that we've had meetings with NGOs such as Section 27 uh, um, and many others, including the Human Rights Commission. We have agreed on meeting with them on specific intervals. We are now due for the next meeting with them. We met them towards the end of the year last year. We are going to, we have already received a request from Section 27 that they would want to have a meeting with us. And we're going to accede to that request, Minister. A problem statement, background and context, overview of the program, um, and overview of uh, safe program, overview of the uh, ACD, budget and expenditure. Government has invested a lot of money in dealing with this problem. You'll see when I share the presentation with you. And some of the weaknesses, I've always said this, Minister, that it was not the inability of government to invest in eradicating these inappropriate and unsafe structures. It's an inadequate capacity within the build industry. And I want to repeat, inadequate capacity within the build industry to move with the greater speed that we require. And you'll see in our monitoring, we now even go out on a daily basis to monitor them, to enhance that capacity. And we're looking at different things to really accelerate uh, uh, the delivery. Contribution by donors and partners, as the minister correctly pointed out, international donors and donors uh, domestically in South Africa, I'll also touch that, the monitoring, then I will conclude. This first part uh, simply highlights the specific areas of delivery, inappropriate structures, which is about replacing them, uh, schools that are built by communities, built of mud. Many of those schools are collapsing. Schools that are roofed with asbestos, we, we're looking at replacing those as well. Uh, Planky School in the Western Cape, We've replaced many of those, and we're still going to continue to do so. In terms of water, the challenge here, Minister, is that when we even send a questionnaire to schools that, do you have drinking water, they would say yes. But the drinking water that they are referring to, some of them refer to rain-harvested water, which is not safe drinking water. 
and we are dealing with that challenge uh, with provinces. I've been to many schools where I was really surprised to observe that both learners, uh, teachers, and the other staff members would use harvested uh, water, which is not safe um, uh, for them. So it's an issue that uh, we are dealing with together with provinces. Sanitation, of course, there are three categories that we are dealing with here. Number one, it's schools without sanitation at all, no sanitation, where both teachers and learners would go to the felt or the bush to help themselves. Uh, we don't have such schools anymore. Um, so we had to make sure that these schools do have at least mobile facilities whilst we are coming to provide a permanent solution. But we also have minister schools that have inappropriate and unsafe structures. A section 27, you know, indicated a figure of about 900 in the 9,000, sorry, in the beginning. From our NIMS data of 2016, Mr. Van der Westen, and we had about 8,000 of such schools, 8,000 in 2016. We had 8,000 of them, and we'll share with you data on how we've, we've dealt with that. Electricity, we're providing supply of electricity. We connect to the nearest um, um, uh, point where uh, 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 the rollout, the, the, the uh, broad rollout has been um, done by ESCOM together with our Department of Energy, then we connect to the, to, to, to the closest point. Um, we also um, uh, have what we call Education Infrastructure Grant, EIG. This grant is made available to all nine provinces to also deal with uh, uh, infrastructure rollout. DBE depends on the school backlog infrastructure grant. And we're driving it on two uh, programs, ACD and SAFE, as I've already indicated. We base our problem statement, Minister, from the extract of the NDP, which clearly directed us uh, to ensure that schools meet all the minimum standards for infrastructure and uh, progressively upgrade each school to be at an optimum standard level. Uh, the NDP continues uh, to acknowledge the progress that we have made when it was uh, um, uh, published in 2012, 10 years. We had made progress and will also share further what progress we have made and there are figures that are also indicated here. And the NDP also says we need to improve the quality of our information, the quality of our data. Uh, which is a matter that we are dealing with as well. In terms of background and context, I won't be long on this one, Minister. Just to indicate that uh, initially there was 3,898 uh, schools that had inappropriate and unsafe sanitation facilities, and government immediately after the president launched the SAFE program in 2018, then uh, made an investment of 2.8 billion rands, which is indicated here. The first year of the MTF was 700 million. The second year was 800 million. The last uh, outer year, the third year, was 1.3 billion. We also expected provinces to complement the school backlog infrastructure grant through the EIG that we are providing to them, but also through what we call equitable share. Equitable share is money uh, that is uh, allocated to provinces directly, not through the grant, not through the national department. We, we also, as the minister uh, has indicated earlier on, want to thank donors in South Africa and outside who made good by helping us uh, to deal with this challenge. Um, 
And I just thought that I must remind the nation where the prevalence of the unsafe and inappropriate pit latrines are. Uh, Eastern Cape, you can see uh, KZN, you can see Limpopo are the three provinces that constitute the, ma the majority of these inappropriate uh, uh, sanitation facilities or pit latrines. You had them in the other six provinces. There were very few. That's why those provinces were essentially able to deal with them uh, quickly. But in these three provinces, we're still there. It's not only... The minister indicated that in terms of Section 4 and Section 3 of the National Education uh, Policy Act, our responsibility is to develop policy, monitor, and support. But we've gone beyond that. We're now delivering these projects, and we go down to monitor to ensure that uh, uh, we move with the requisite uh, speed. Uh, some of the challenges that we identified, I'll just focus on the constraints, and then uh, maybe as I touch the constraint, you read it in conjunction with the remedial measure. Uh, poor, poor delivery culture among implementing agents. We had to deal with that. It's a fact. Uh, a project of two to three months, at the most six months, would take up to three years to complete. And we've made sure that that doesn't happen anymore. But that's where we need to depart from. Uh, poor project management and capacity uh, Indeed, within implementing agents and even within ourselves, we had to engender a new culture of project management. Um, the, the reality of COVID-19, where everything almost came to a halt, you'll see with lockdown, we even struggled to get uh, materials from manufacturers because uh, there was no movement at all. That's the reality that we had to go through. And after um, the government allowed the build industry to go back to work, we even said to them, you have to divide your work into at least shifts. There should be shifts working during the day and the shifts working during the night. Because delivery of water and sanitation is an emergency in the context of COVID-19. That we were able to achieve until we're, going, we're able to go back uh, almost uh, to normal. The unstable baseline allocation because money which was allocated for infrastructure had to now uh, uh, be reallocated to deal with COVID essentials, um, including, you know, uh, PPEs and so on. The unreliability of, of data which I said we are dealing with we're no longer going to be working with spreadsheets, uh, managing such a huge portfolio. Uh, we have uh, NIMS, which has always been there. The problem has been to maintain it and keep it alive all the time. But we've also brought in EFMS, which is an information system that we use for, for infrastructure, which will help to coordinate everything that we do to be able just at the tick of the button to account for everything. Um, of course, the, the issue of monitoring, we had to deal with it. I must say that the minister and deputy minister convenes, uh, convene infrastructure meetings every week, every Friday. And I'll show you the evidence of that uh, to just get weekly updates on what's happening in infrastructure. Deployment of ICT, I've also indicated the systems that we are using now. We also use WhatsApps. We put principals on WhatsApp groups to give us weekly and daily updates on a construction activities on site so that we're able to monitor contractors. In the past, con a contractor would come and stay for a month or two without, you know, getting into any construction activity on site, and we don't get to know about that. We, are, we now have WhatsApp groups. Principals are on those WhatsApp groups. District and provincial officials are on those WhatsApp groups. And they, they give us uh, almost uh, 
you know, immediate information on the spot. Um, we've also had challenges of communities rejecting alternative technology that we deploy to build either sanitation or even, uh, you know, classrooms. We've had many of them. I had to intervene, meet with, with uh, school management teams, school governing bodies, uh, to cajole them, uh, to accept the technology that we use, which is fast and even more reliable alternative technology that we use for building. Of course, limited capacity of some manufacturers in providing the materials that we have, um, uh, challenges and uh, contestation of what is called, I'm sure you know about it, business forums. Uh, we've had to intervene. I met with some on sites. Some issues that they are raising are legitimate. It's about 30% that government is saying must be de dedicated to stimulate local economy. But some of the issues that they are using are illegal and not, should not actually uh, be tolerated. But some of the issues that they are raising are indeed legitimate. We have built up our own capacity minister. Mr. Van der Westeisen is a chief engineer. He was not there before. We recruited him. We had recruited uh, the other chief engineer, chief uh, quantity surveyors. We've got architects. Uh, you know, the, the specialized skills that you require in the build industry over time, we've been able to build that capacity. Now, quickly, we're sharing even some of the pictures here. Uh, and you can see these are the kind of facilities that uh, we've been able to roll out uh, over time. Well, as we indicated earlier on, original baseline was 3,898. The minister referred to rationalization, and rationalization is the measure and closure of unviable small schools, particularly in your commercial farming areas or in the villages that are getting depopulated. As the numbers of children dwindle, many of these schools naturally close, so we had to measure and close many of them. We still have some because you find that, you know, um, across the mountain, across the river, that's the only school that is available for the community that is located there. And it wouldn't be safe for learners or even adults, you know, to go to the nearby school, which will be across the mountain or across the river. We've kept some of these schools. Our minimum is that if a school has learners that are lower than 135, uh, that is deemed to be not a school. Such a school should be closed. But we have allowed a few of these because of the circumstances that I've just explained. And currently, the number of schools on this uh, program is 3,397. As the minister indicated, 2,489 of these schools have been completed. Reach practical completion, it means they've been completed. PC, practical completion, Mr. Van der Westeisen will explain to you, means that the school is now ready to be used for the facility, rather is now ready to be used for, for its intended purpose. Whether it's a toilet, whether it's a school ground, or whether it's classrooms, when we say it has reached practical completion, it means it's ready for use for uh, the purpose that it was intended for. And we do hand over many of the schools. It gives you then a variance of only 908 schools, which still needed to be provided with safe and appropriate sanitation. And we also, these are some of the toilets that uh, uh, we built, uh, as we share with you. And, and we've provided this, this uh, breakdown, and again, it's 300, uh, I mean, 3,397 um, that are allocated on planning and design is 278. On tender is 201. Uh, those that are at 25% uh, uh, construction is 78. 25 to 50, 189. 51 uh, to 79%, 122. And 76 to 99, 44. And those that have are being used by schools is 2,489. 
I've heard uh, when this tragic incident happened, Amnesty International still referred to 3,000 schools that do not have safe and appropriate sanitation. Here are the figures. That is not the point. If people could just correct that fact. And as I've said, we've been sharing this information with NGOs and uh, uh, many organizations that we meet with. These are some of the... Um, um, you know, the, the facilities that we roll out. This is just a breakdown of actual visits uh, plan progress and also what is projected by the implementing agents. This, this presentation will be made available and we give you a breakdown from April uh, 2022 up to March 2023. That's the breakdown that we have provided in terms of, of the figures that we have here. And again here, in terms of the year under review, 2022-2023 financial year, of the 2.4 billion that is allocated uh, for this, uh, we indicating to you that in terms of the APP uh, for SAFE, uh, it's 435 for SAFE, uh, if it combines with a CD, it's 450, Mr. Van der Vest, is it? Yeah. And then um, uh, implementing agents had uh, projected 442, and, and the actual takes us at 256. May I indicate, as we move towards the end of the financial year, year-end closure, these figures keep changing. I received some last night. I continue to receive some uh, this morning. Uh, we are going to re receive more this coming week. They are going to come fast and furious. And that's why I said even next week we could come and brief again. Uh, there are many projects that are starting to reach practical completion. But as at the 23rd of, uh, of March, the, the, these are the figures that you have in front of you. And we're showing the contribution of different implementing agents, DBSA, the Development Bank of uh, uh, South Africa, and the NECT, uh, the National Education Collaboration Trust. This is what they've contributed. The Kuha Development Corporation, uh, the donors, and we also indicate in CD and EIG. But on the extreme right, which is in blue, we're giving you the actual in terms of Kuha, in terms of DBSA, the Free State Department of uh, Education did not feature this time. We also give you the contribution by any city within this financial year and Mvula Trust. Uh, ACIDI, uh, that's where the inappropriate uh, uh, structures are dealt with. Original baseline was 510, and again, because of measure and closure, uh, we now have 331, uh, a total of 316 of these schools have already been built and are being used by schools. It's only 15 that, it, that is left. But as I've said to you, we continue to uncover more because at the time when the audit was conducted, uh, many of these schools were intact. They didn't show vulnerability. But with the heavy rains, you know, unprecedented uh, natural disasters that we have seen, even in KZN, the list continues uh, to, to increase. And then, uh, again, in terms of water supply, the baseline was 1,117. Also, owing to rationaliza rationalization and measure of schools, um, the current number of school uh, of schools that are on our list is uh, 1,271, a total of 1,159 uh, 1 of these schools have received water and continue to receive water. Only 12 are still outstanding, which we are dealing with at the moment. We're showing you some of the, the, the evidence that we collect uh, on site. Electricity. The baseline had 902, and again, owing to rationalization and closure of unviable small schools, we now have three, three, 373 of these schools, and all of them 
have received uh, electricity. Uh, and the, the picture of the, 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 some of the, the information that we collected from site. Uh, sanitation from a city, 701, and uh, the number, of course, increased to 1,053, um, and uh, 1,053 of these schools uh, have moved to practical completion. And this is some of the data that we share. Uh, please uh, uh, take note of the 3,032 that we show there and uh, 3,005 that have reached uh, practical completion uh, in terms of the extreme right of the summary. Um, um, current uh, status of a CD per program, we give you a breakdown of inappropriate structures, of water supply, of sanitation, of electricity, and fencing. And one area, Minister, that uh, we have to go to uh, much more than we are doing currently is providing fencing to schools for issues of, of safety of learners. Many of our schools require um, appropriate fencing. And that's the area. We are meeting with provinces on the 29th uh, to make sure that we make sure that uh, uh, this receives attention from provinces. And here we're providing just the actual plan, progress in a city, in appropriate structure, and we give an update on that. I had a meeting with the, the group executive of um, DBSA minister only yesterday, and he's assured me that uh, many of these schools are going to reach practical completion except only for three, uh, which should get us from a target of, of 30%. And then we're giving a progress there. Um, as I've indicated, uh, in terms of the APP is 30, uh, actual projected is 27, will be short of three, as I've said. But at the moment, we are at 13, at 40. But as I said yesterday, he's assured me that uh, the remaining schools are definitely going to be completed. There are challenges with the provision of uh, uh, some materials and they've managed to resolve that, and they are working flat out even during the weekends to make sure that we meet our target. Um, a contribution of implementing agents, as we can see, Kuha again, uh, in terms of a CD, DBSA, uh, the Free State Department of Education having contributed five, and IDT 51, Kuha 31, and Vula Trust is not involved in the inappropriate uh, structures of schools. In terms of the current year, uh, all the schools come from DBSA, already 14, and we still more from them, uh, about 13, which would take us to 27. And then in terms of water supply, we're providing a breakdown there. The majority of the outstanding projects are with IDT, and Mr. Van der Westeisen is chasing those projects to make sure that come the end of the financial year, uh, uh, these schools that are involved do have drinking clean water uh, supplied to them. As you can see, the APP target is 50, uh, projected is 51, the actual is at 42, uh, so we at 78%. And then contribution of a CD per implementing agent, again in terms of the sub-program, we're indicating the overall contribution and indicating progress for 2022-2023. And uh, we're providing a breakdown of actuals against the plant. And then again, we're indicating um, the figures here that everything seems to be going well in terms of sanitation for a CD. And then we're indicating overall contribution and contribution in terms of the current financial year. In terms of expenditure, overall is 2.4 billion that government uh, has invested in this financial year, but over the years we can work that out. It's far more than that. Um, you can see that our expenditure as at Friday uh, stood uh, in terms of the invoices that we received is at 1.9 billion, 
uh, invoices plus what we had to pay from the previous financial year, which is accruals, is 2.1 uh, billion. Uh, in terms of projected, is uh, 2.1 billion. And then projected plus the accruals will take us to 2.3, which will be 96% expenditure for what the DORA has uh, allocated to us. I've indicated what goes with the certificate, what is captured on BAS. BAS is the financial system that we use in government, which is used by all of us. Um, uh, we are at 1.8 and which means that the teams have to move and work uh, almost 24 hours to capture the invoices that are outside. So that come the end of the financial year, nothing goes to the next financial year. Okay, this I have explained. This is EIG. You can see that uh, with education infrastructure grant, we are at 91%. Um, and uh, the, the lowest spending there is uh, Northwest. But Minister, when we had to take the decision to move money from some provinces to others, provinces that were underperforming, number one was Mpumalanga, followed by Eastern Cape. And that's why we had to take uh, 100 million from each of those and then move it to provinces that were experiencing a boiling point in terms of their expenditure. And these figures are revised after that movement happened. And that's why you'll see these figures uh, that you see in front of you uh, at the moment. It's after, you know, the, the, the movement of funds and the reconciliation that, was happened, there, that happened there. Projects that are uh, on, 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 on implementation, it's 7,853. And projects that have reached practical completion, it's 1,692. These are multi-year projects. Mr. Mafuku is here. He can explain if there's a need to explain that. Uh, some schools are so big that they take 18 months, they would run over two years. And some would even run over three years, depending on the size and the complexity of the school. Uh, ECD uh, maintenance grant, it's one grant where we are not doing well, Minister, we must accept having received uh, this responsibility from the Department of Social Development. Um, we working with the team to make sure that uh, we check up our systems to improve our performance here. As you can see, our performance is very low, is at 55%. We don't want to tell any lies and claim uh, easy victories, as Amelka Cabral is saying. In this area, we are not doing well, and I'm meeting with the line function, and we'll be meeting with provinces to crack uh, this, this one uh, out, Minister. We also receive contribution from donors. South Korea is one of those and many other foreign missions, and we've indicated uh, even details of the projects here. As we indicated earlier on, we've also indicated special projects, the name of those special projects. Uh, Unilever is one such that contributes enormously to help us deal particularly with uh, uh, pit latrines that are dangerous and inappropriate. Uh, inappropriate. Uh, the mining houses is also helping us a lot, as you can see. North Cross South Africa is one of those. Um, the South African uh, Water Research Commission, we are working with them on a number of these projects to look at different solutions. I've talked about the challenge of the availability of water, South Africa being one of those 20 countries that experience scarcity of water. We're looking at a uh, grey water solution where you circulate water there are already institutions and business that are using the grey solution to deal with the water challenge uh, in, uh, in the country so that we can deploy it um, where it's not easy to do so. Sibanye Steel Water, also, you know, responsible for the schools, uh, and we sharing some information there. And other partners that are listed here, Tirisano, uh, et cetera, and et cetera, I won't go through all of them. Uh, um, okay, Afbop. Afbop also, uh, they, they, they might say that I've left them out. Asupol, yeah, Asupol has actually committed, Minister, to additional 100 schools. 
that they are going to help us with to eradicate uh, inappropriate sanitation. Uh, they've been doing exceptionally well. Uh, I've, bought, I've bought both in terms of uh, schools and other fa facilities that we have. Um, uh, monitoring, I'll just show, I mean, monitoring done by the minister, the, mini the meetings that we have Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and even Friday to coordinate the work uh, that is uh, happening in infrastructure. And we're also indicating that it has helped us to even clear our, our audit profile to even move from qualified uh, audit to unqualified audit, almost very close to clean audit. Uh, and we're indicating the benefits of that there. And uh, these are some of uh, the data, some of the data from construction site, all of us going out to construction site. We've got the program support unit, the PSU, in the department, which plays an important role in chasing implementing agents, in validating the invoices that are submitted to the department, whether we are paying for, I mean, value for money. Because in the course of rushing these implementing agents, the um, undesirable or unintended consequence might happen. You happen to pay for not what you are supposed to pay. We've got the PSU, uh, uh, whose responsibility, among others, is to make sure that invoices that come to the department are value for money. This is the impact of monitoring overall. And the last slide there, I'm echoing the sentiments of the minister. We are not where we should be, but we are very close to be where we should be. Uh, I have shared the data with you, and I invite you, any one of you, to even join our monitoring teams as we move around in the country, uh, the length and breadth of the country, uh, to monitor this work. Mr. Van der Westeisen, I know you'll do it in 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, the Komape matter. Thank you. Okay, we come out of that briefing there. It seems like a race against time now to eradicate uh, pit latrines in our schools. Also, Director General there for Basic Education there, Matanzi Mamwele, just detailing and giving an overview on how government will move in this regard. About time is what most people will say as far as that is concerned. Also, plans to replace schools that are ro roofed with asbestos as unsafe schools have also been identified. Also, 2,478 that the number of schools that have been provided with infrastructure. We wrap it there now. And of course, it's the top of the hour. We take you to some of your top stories this hour.